Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I was at uh, S4 two years ago just kind of observing, and uh, now we have an opportunity to actually be a sponsor here, so we're, we're very happy to be here, and we're learning a lot in the sessions. I hope you are as well. Um, as a pioneer in OT cybersecurity, we wanted to share some observations and lessons we've learned and tell you a bit more about our company, our product, and uh, our technology. I love that picture. It's only about 30 years old, so I'm looking. These bright lights are making me look. And face, you're looking fine there also. So uh, just a quick overview. We'll, we'll talk about some of the lessons we've learned. I mentioned some recommendations we have. We are not in a forum for product demonstration here, but we're going to be at the Cabanas uh, all afternoon, tomorrow afternoon. We'd love to have you come and have a look at our product, and, uh, and, and, and we'd share a lot more about the technology with you. So the company, I, you know, when I mentioned we're going to talk to you about some of our experiences, most of you in the room probably don't know who Centrio is. So you're wondering how we would have experiences that we could share with you. But Centrio was first envisioned about five or six years ago and founded in 2014, but in Lyon, France. So we've been up and running there for m multiple years now. We have offices in France, Germany, USA. We have significant partnerships for distribution around the world. And we have 50 plus customers worldwide right now protecting tens of thousands of devices. I was looking at this number when we created the slide presentation. I was, you know, should we say 50 plus? Should we say so? tens of thousands of devices? And, and I, I have a hard time with our, our friends in Europe. Do you all know what the word sales puffery is? You know, it's a, it's a instead of lying, you're allowed to exaggerate things you do and say. And it's really interesting in a growing new market like this, what is said by people in our industry. So, you know, people claim a lot of things. Check for yourself. We're pretty confident about our numbers and, and we're all growing and we're all trying to establish ourselves as leaders in this space. Like the other vendors we are, uh, that, are that we compete with generally, we're VC backed and we have a similar vision, but with a different focus. And we'll share a bit more about that in our, our analysis. Uh, we were the cool Gartner, uh, cool vendor for 2018 by Gartner in the OT cybersecurity space. So it's nice to get those kind of plaudits from uh, some of the industry analysts. So our product is called ICS CyberVision. Uh, it is an industrial asset inventory and security platform. We focus on visibility is a very big thing for us, and we'll talk a bit about our focus on the control engineer. So we have dynamic asset inventory and we identify vulnerabilities. We track changes, events, and we watch for process integrity. Of course, security by detecting anomalies. And we'll talk a bit about that and how we do alerting. And of course, we have to be able to integrate with the IT SOC and the IT organization. So a bit about, so we, here's our platform. So our goal is to empower the OT staff by having an interface that matches the way they view their industrial processes. And we think that, and again, here's my sales puffery, we think our interface for the control engineer and anybody looking at it is probably the strongest in the industry. Uh, other, other vendors have different strengths. We think this is probably one of our key strengths. We also have it a different approach to sensor deployment. We certainly can have a, a centralized sensor working with our centralized uh, a console. But our model, our design is that the sensor is an application. And we want to be able to have our customers be able to run it where it needs to run. I was in a presentation recently where the presenter up here in my place was joking about, yeah, we could have our customers put a sensor on every switch. That'd make us a lot of money, but it wouldn't be good for them. Our model is our customers should put the sensor where they want to. So if they want to run a sensor in a extreme uh, environmental a, a, a condition area, use a rugged comm sensor from Siemens. They're designed for that. Our sensor application runs on that device. We run on Cisco IOX boxes. We run on Siemens Nano. So we're expanding that list. So you can put sensors where you need them. And we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. And then, of course, we have to be able to collaborate with a variety of IT tools and processes. We have partnerships with a variety of vendors in this space. And that partnership ranges from Palo Alto actually being able to send information to Palo Alto firewalls to change rules to you know, other levels of integration. 
and again, and again, I wouldn't say just us, but in this space, a lot of vendors like us are looking for those kind of partnerships to increase the value of our product and the other products you're using. So, and I, I, I laugh on some of these because you all hadn't heard of us before, but we've, we've got uh, a lot of field proven uh, uh, strength behind us. So, compatible with most major OT solutions, we support a lot of protocols. Um, you know, the comment that was made, uh, there was a great presentation this morning, was it CLP, Face, the uh, people that they talked about their installation experience. And one thing they stress, which we think we agree with, supporting a protocol is one thing, doing something with that protocol data you get is something else. So we do support most major protocols. If you have one that we don't support, we'd love to talk about adding that to our, our, our group of them we support. We have some very nice partnerships with people like Schneider Siemens, Vinci Energy, uh, Talas, and, and many, many more. I'll use the Siemens was, uh, one as an example. Siemens did a broad search, in-depth testing of a lot of products, and they wanted to be able to have a white label kind of product. So if you get Siemens anomaly detection, if you go in their catalog and get it, it is one of two products, ours, and another company I won't name, but they're very good at promoting themselves, so I'm sure you've heard of them. Uh, so, but, but you wouldn't, most of you probably didn't know that. So Siemens chose us as one of those, and we're expanding that partnership. So we're, we're very proud of those kind of relationships. And uh, another commentary in this space is, we all have these kind of partnerships, it's kind of funny. You know, so one company in, invests in somebody else, but they partner with somebody else as a reseller, and we're, we're all trying to find our way with all these relationships. We do have customers in industrial verticals around the world, energy, oil and gas, utilities, manufacturing, automotive, process. Here are some examples. So we formally launched in the US in June, so I wish we had more arrows pointing to the United States, but uh, we, we will have many soon, I'm sure. But you can see the variety of industries we're already installed and supporting customers, transportation to manufacturing, uh, offshore oil and gas floating rigs, et cetera. Some of the lessons learned. Um, our focus on providing something for the control engineer, so pretty typical, I don't know this IP address. We do a pilot, we go in, I love being there the first day, you're sitting in a room, the control engineer has a printout of all the IP addresses and they've got a big monitor, we start doing our sensing, we use our AI to start propagating and grouping devices and everybody's calling out IP addresses. Hey, what's this one, what's this one? That, that's the winding station number two. And what's this one? I don't know, it's not on my list. Never seen it before. So it, it, you know, what, what device is this? Um, are there DNS queries to Russia? Well, I don't know about that one. <laughs> Other people in our government have issues with that, but I don't think it's an issue for here. One thing that I comment on, I noticed one of the speakers this morning was talking about the worldwide threat of governmental intrusion, whatever, and I'm, I'm sure that's something to, to think about. However, most of our customers, they're a lot more concerned about control engineers making mistakes, under-trained, under-slept, over-hung, um, a variety of reasons why they might be making mistakes on their PLCs, making a programming change. So mistake, malevolence, bad employees, um, you need to know what's going on in your network environment. Proprietary protocols don't mean they're very secure, so we see constant no security patches, uh, man in the middle spoofs, etc. We've got a, a, a great story on a pilot. It was a German uh, manufacturing for automobiles, and we went in, did a pilot, did our first scanning, and the feedback we gave to the, uh, uh, the manager there the next morning was, we see a connection to the outside. It, it, something happened last night, it probably shouldn't have happened. And his answer, and again, I don't mean to stereotype people, I have a German background. His answer was, no, that's impossible. It must be a bug in your software. So it was a pilot, so we didn't disagree, and we went to check our, our we started debugging our software again. No, not really. And he came back two hours later and said, oh yeah, well, I apologize. Uh, the, night, the night team, they don't like driving in from home, so they put a back door in one of the systems because it's a lot easier to support them that way. So we see a lot of that, and I'm sure you, you have challenges in your environments. Um, another thing we think is vital is the OT manager, the OT staff, are the people who understand 
the OT processes so they understand if they find information, if you send that to the IT people, they don't know what that means. So you can send them all kinds of stuff into your SIM and put it on your displays in the IT side, but they're not really going to get value out of that where the OT person is vital in understanding, interpreting what that means, and then addressing the issue. And of course, this issue has been beaten to death, but there is a lack of alignment in most cases with IT teams' experience, goals, and, uh, and what they're charted with. Of course, the other problem is how do you start and how do you scale? Um, this is just an example of some of the things we've, we've worked with our clients on. So the Kubler-Ross change curve can be applied to a lot of different industries. You know, the, the, the first thing is there's some kind of disruption. Then you have the denial phase. And then, of course, you don't have time to deal with it. You hope for a solution to come from the sky. And then you apply methodologies and suitable tools to do it. The, the biggest challenge we see is most of the people here are somewhere in this circle area. And a lot of times your management is somewhere back over in the denial and shock phase. So getting those to come into alignment is, is vital to uh, having a project be successful. Um, people like Gartner have come out with a lot of various tools. Uh, uh, loved hearing some of like Dragos' presentations where they obviously have great experience and tools in understanding how to properly uh, put a system like this in place and make it successful. This is one that talks about establishing procedures, guidelines, standards, and then finally having a converged CEO-blessed charter for the organization. You need to make sure your policies follow the racy kind of a model where you do have responsibility, accountability. You've consulted with and informed people on your security policies, who owns them, communicating it. We have a set of playbooks that we've developed working with our clients to assist in efficiently and effectively designing, deploying, and uh, configuring and uh, customizing your installation. So we have project checklists we use, training materials we have, uh, assessments and things that we do with our team and our partners, and our partners use our playbooks. So here's where I talked a bit about earlier the, the edge approach we have for uh, our sensors. So we have a hardware sensor, two of them that we provide, and a lot of our customers love them. Our sensor seven is a hardware data diode, so there is no chance of data going back across onto the network. So we're doing passive scan. Oh, by the way, we are passive scanning. We are certainly intrigued by active. We're evaluating active uh, scanning now. We have a plan in place, uh, and our, the delivery of active scanning we have will certainly be uh, a lot of governors on it, a lot of controls to make sure it isn't improperly used. And uh, I, we saw a nice presentation uh, earlier today about an active scanning product, and I think they have that same, that same approach of making sure it's used properly, because it can be very effective when used properly. Um, but I also mentioned then we support a variety of sensor. We run our sensor application on other boxes. And we really see this list expanding because there's no reason why you have to redo your network in order to put in a product like this. You don't have to re-architect it. We ought to be able to support the, arch the architecture you have. We do the deep packet inspection at the sensor level. So we're putting very little uh, data on your network. And thus, less, you have less traffic, theoretically. Um, we can lower your monitoring cost, and then you have to worry about a configuration of your network. So we use an AI approach to taking the, if you look on the left side, you have your assets as discovered by the sensors. How do you convert that into something that's usable by the control engineer? So our AI automatically does that, that, that for you, where we convert that information where they can then take action on it. Uh, and I invite you to come to our uh, Cabana session on uh, uh, tomorrow afternoon and see uh, a presentation of this. Okay, I'm not moving that mouse, so that little hand is not me. I don't know if you see it on yours. Um, the other thing I want to point out is we will have an active uh, OT network there, PLC switches and things, so we can show you live product and how we actually uh, do our monitoring. 
but the way we handle mapping and presenting connections, et cetera, is, is vital. The control engineers, with a variety of uh, uh, OT systems, it helps if we can convert that into one single language that they can understand so that we create tags that are uniform as presented to the control engineer so they don't have to be necessarily experts on every protocol and every product that's out there. They can uh, use these tags to help manage that system without having to understand all the other protocols. So we do provide OT security dashboards. Um, we have a beautiful look and feel for the control engineer to look at, but then we also share that. We're compatible with a variety of SIM uh, products. And again, that, there's a whole range of complete integration to we support them. And we can talk about whatever one would match your needs if we need to. We think architectural flexibility is important. Um, you know, when you come to these conferences, you hear a lot of stories, good, bad, and ugly, about deployments, successful, not successful, challenges people have. And we're still at a very early stage, all of us, in, in deploying and really supporting OT cybersecurity. And, and, and we hear these stories. So we're, so we're vendors. We're out there selling real-time monitoring of all your devices starting tomorrow. And we'd be glad to sell you that. Any one of you, if you, I'll be around after the show, and we'll take an order to do that. However, when you talk to real customers, we're, we have a prospect we're working with right now. They have 102 plants. They have done two significant POCs with us. They know our product very well. They know their people very well. And they're excited about rolling it out, but they're looking at what's it going to take to roll out to 102 plants. And they said, you know, based on where we are today, if we could use your product to scan each plant once a month, and then every next month, compare what we knew last month, we'd be way ahead of where we are now. That's not real-time cybersecurity scanning. That's not what I'm selling, but it's something you may want to do. So we, we have some ways to address that. We have one very significant in the energy industry company. What they want to do, we have something called a mobile kit. It's a suitcase. It's got a sensor. It's got our center in it. And it's got wheels. And what they want to do is buy a bunch of those. And they want to be able to have their regular uh, maintenance staff take them to their various assets. Could be an offshore oil rig, could be a processing plant, and do a scan once per X. I don't know, once every two weeks, once a month, whatever. And then what they want us to do is be able to have a way, which we do, to move that up to then a either cloud-based or centralized server-based things so it can be stored, A, B, viewed by other people. And that way have very quick and very broad coverage of all their uh, devices, their, their sites around the world. And again, I, I go, it, it's not what all us vendors are up here selling. We want to sell you our real-time monitoring, do it, but the complexity of that, the staff it requires, et cetera, there is a way to prioritize also. We have clients who have, one is a, um, um, they deliver natural gas down to the, to the home, right? So it comes in on a ship, somewhere they offload it, and it gets out to the home. They've prioritized their assets. So full-time, real-time scanning and updating by us. Anomaly detection, perfect. That's for the main area and the storage area. Downstream, less. At the far end, they'll be happy to scan once a month. It's less critical. They don't have to worry as much. It's, it's, a, it's, it's less vulnerable. So we think from an architecture flexibility point of view, we've got to be able to provide our customers with the ability to use a product like this, provide benefits and value, not just to the IT SOC, but to the control engineer, and to, to be able to put something out now. If you have 102 plants and you can deploy to one plant a month, well, there's 102 months before you get all covered. You may want to take an intermediate step to get to where you really want to get to, provide some level of protection between then and now. We have a new cloud version of our product coming out so that you can do your sensor scanning out here now and send it up to our cloud-based server, or you could host your own cloud, or our partners are going to start hosting the cloud-based server. 
So you can take some of that management of that infrastructure and uh, deployment of that and put it in the cloud. Again, that's not for everyone. We're not pushing it for everyone. We've got a couple of customers now who are eager to test that because when you're, when you're dragging that mobile kit around, it's nice to be able to upload it to the cloud instead of uploading it to something else. So one of the points we like to make is we do think we have architectural flexibility and a, and a bias toward that where we're not trying to dictate to our customers how they have to architect themselves to be able to use a technology like this. We also have what we call offline mode where someone can walk around, take a USB, plug it into a, PS a PC or a sensor of some kind, gather that data on the USB drive, stick it in a laptop and upload it to your server. Again, that, that kind of flexibility to get coverage and protection, but working toward that full real-time kind of protection. So it's one of my biases too. I, I just, I go to these shows and everybody, everybody talks about it. And you know, how many full deployments? I just talked to a very big oil and gas company. They started doing this three years ago. They've deployed to 50 sites. And, that, and they've done a great job. And they have, they're about 40% deployed. Maybe it'll accelerate, maybe it'll get better, but is there a way to do something to protect you in some way now, rolling toward that perfect solution? I look back at the IT side and go, you know what? The first thing people do is roll out one thing, AV protection. Then they, they had firewalls. Then they started going to the advanced kind of protections they have today. They didn't try to get all the way to here on day one. And again, we'll sell you all the way to here today, but there are some steps you may be able to take in between. So we want to give comprehensive visibility on the OT assets. We really want to give control engineers value that goes beyond cybersecurity and give, of course, the IT SOC people all the data they need and to integrate that to their total IT cybersecurity solution. Um, so it's still day one for all of us, for the, on the vendor side, on the customer side. We love working with our customers to continue to refine our product. Um, we were, we'll do a demonstration live at our cabana tomorrow. I'd love to show you that. And to make you come by and, uh, oh, the last one's not there, sorry. The last one's a picture of the drone we're giving away tomorrow. So you've got to come by and see us, DJI Phantom 2 standard. It's the drone I use, so it's, it's got to be a good one. So come by and see a demo and uh, put your uh, card in for the drawing for the uh, drone. Can I answer any questions? I see one, kind of. Uh, sorry, it's more like a product question. Uh, do you guys license based on endpoints or per appliances? Because you had the reference to uh, the previous vendor uh, who would be happy to sell you more and more boxes. You said you were doing it differently. <laughs> so I'm wondering, you know, do you license based on the size of the environment or uh, yes. the number of boxes you deploy? Yes and yes. Um, you, you know, one of the interesting things, uh, I came from the IT security side. So one of the interesting things in our space is there, there existed a model already for how do you price AV security? We all know it's, you know, $12 per PC per year, depending on how many you have or what, whatever, 10, whatever it is. In our space, there wasn't that. So we've worked pretty hard with a lot of people like Gartner, et cetera, uh, other consultants, our customers, uh, people like Siemens to how do we structure our pricing? We want to be able to structure in some way based on volume. Um, so, okay. So, so um, as I mentioned, if you buy one of our hardware sensors, there is a charge for the hardware sensor. We do sell that pretty close to cost. It's not a big profit maker for us. We're, we're making money on the software side. For the, um, for the overall solution itself, we do it by number of devices in some sense. So we put a token value on a, an HMI is one token value, uh, a switch is a different token value. We add those up, we multiply by X, big quantity discount, and that's how we do our pricing. So it is somewhat based on quantity. It's number of devices and then discounted based on quantity. If, does that answer your question? And we'd be glad to you know, show you other examples and things like that. And, but, but by the way, the sensor stuff, if you're using our sensor as an application, we don't charge for that. So deploy a lot of sensor software, we don't care. If you buy our hardware, then there is a charge. 